Good afternoon. My name is Lindsay, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the National Learning and Action Network call follow-up event. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. Ms. Risa Hayes with Quality Innovation Network and National Coordinating Center. You may begin your conference. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the National Learning and Network Learning and Action Network follow-up event, part of our quarterly Sharing Knowledge and Improving Healthcare series. We're very happy to have you with us today as we reconnect with the speakers from last month's call that focused on advancing effective communication and coordination of care. If you're not already on the WebEx, you'll be joining us in the WebEx Event Center, and you'll need to access your registration confirmation email and registration ID to log in. So my name is Risa Hayes from Telogen. I'm the lead for leadership and organizing for the Quality, Quality Innovation Network National Coordinating Center. My colleague, Steve Eastfeld, also from the um, Quality Innovation Network National Coordinating Center, will be monitoring our WebEx chat board. So please be sure to participate as we go along and feel free to ask your questions, type in comments, and during our coaching session, we'll even encourage you to um, participate as a chair coach through chat as well. All slides and resources and the recording from today's session will be posted on QIOprogram.org under the News and Events tab. Steve will be sharing the direct link in chat if he hasn't already. And just a few reminders and housekeeping items before we get started today. Free to participate by chat and keep your um, the lines will be on mute until we start the Q&A session. So the purpose for the series. Um, I'd like to take just a minute without reading everything that's on this, this slide here. Um, I'll just mention a few of the high points of the uh, importance of the series and why we share this with you. The audience for the series is very broad and inclusive of a variety of healthcare provider types, partners, and patients. And the purpose is to offer virtual learning and sharing events with a focus on ideas and concepts related specifically to healthcare quality improvement. We ask that you all think of actionable ways to implement the ideas and concepts that you hear presented today and make a commitment to share the information with your own team. And finally, we're always open to new ideas and suggestions for future topics to bring to this audience. So throughout the call and after the call, please feel free to share your ideas with us on other topics that you'd like to hear about in the future. You can also put in your topics in the post-event assessment. Steve will post the email address for suggestions in the chat box. Our agenda for today. Um, today we'll be hearing from our speakers from last month's call, and they'll uh, provide a recap, basically briefly, of the key points from their presentation from last month. Um, the primary purpose of today's call is to follow up on um, the discussion and follow up with all of you in the audience who are on that call, and we'll have a coaching and brainstorming session around a specific challenge related to this topic of effective communication and care coordination. And again, we invite you all to participate in the coaching via the chat with coaching questions, ideas, and even stories from your own experience. Afterward, we will then open the, the lines for a short, facilitated discussion. So first off, let's find out who's in the room. Um, our WebEx operator, if you would please open the first poll, would like to know uh, what type of organization you represent. And again, um, Brandy, our, our WebEx operator, can you open that first poll? Okay. 
Wonderful. So the poll is now open, and we have about 25 seconds left. And these polls help us gauge, again, who our poll is in the audience and making sure that we keep the topics relevant for all the members of our audience. So thank you so much for participating. And we will see, um, uh, we will see the results uh, shortly. So just to move on, we have one more poll for you. We'd love to know if you participated in last month's national call on May 3rd. Um, please participate in the poll to let us know if you are also on that call. And again, um, when we get to, throughout the call and when we get to Q&A, we'd love to hear back from you, um, especially on our call to action from last month's call. So we have about um, you can go ahead and start the poll if you haven't already. It was a short one. All right, wonderful. So it looks like um, uh, looks like several of you were on last month's call and a few new folks. Wonderful, welcome. We're happy to have you here. So in looking at our data from last, year, last month, we we're very excited to see that um, all states and territories were on the call last week, last month, representing um, all but three states. So thank you very much. And again, that gives us a really good idea of who's joining these calls. So while you're listening today, we ask you to think about um, the questions that we have here on the screen. Um, asking yourself, and you may even want to jot down notes, ideas, or questions related to these questions during the call. Um, as you hear the coaching session and the recap, ask, um, ask yourself, what are your goals to drive effective communication and coordination of care in your community, with your partners, in your coalitions, or even with your own um, circle of providers, if, for those of us, um, all of us eventually who are patients? And have you mapped out actions that you plan to take, including timelines for completing those activities and involvement of other team members? In other words, um, have you actually mapped out an action plan to help you get towards your goals of a more effective communication coordination of care? So last month, we heard Tracy Archibald um, talk a little bit about the CMS quality strategy and our work that relates directly to the CMS quality strategy. Um, the topics of these national land calls, um, we try to keep them very relevant and aligned specifically with the CMS quality strategy goals. And the quality strategy guides uh, the activities of all agency components working together. We are, of course, working on these goals as well as part of the Quality Improvement Organization Program. And these goals work together to transform and identify these six prior priority areas. The theme and content of last month's call and today's follow-up are aligned with goal three, promoting effective communication and coordination of care. So now it's my great pleasure to reintroduce Dr. Jane Brock, Medical Director with the Quality and Innovation Network National Coordinating Center at Television. Jane will briefly recap her presentation on our journey of care coordination. Jane, the floor is yours. Thank you, Risa, and thanks, everybody. Um, so I talked last month about, I just uh, essentially gave a history of um, how we ended up where we are now, which is where we're kind of inventing this, this new type of care that we call transitional care um, that is actually um, uh, transitional care is something that we have known we have needed to create for a very, very long time, at least 50 years. Um, but it's been sort of artificially limited by um, really the politics surrounding 
the implementation of the Medicare program. So the Medicare program was, was implemented under a set of conditions of participation regulations which um, ensured that um, each provider type um, will be functioning separately. So the Affordable Care Act is, is what has really made it possible for us to experiment with models uh, that can be sustained that involve truly integrated care patterns um, in the fee-for-service Medicare program. And although not everything is about fee-for-service Medicare, certainly uh, Medicare has set the standard always for um, how other payers um, uh, respond to incentives and how health services or medical services delivery folks um, structure their products. So um, I just want to point out there's been a very long trajectory um, of, of um, knowing what we needed to do, but it's just kind of become possible to actually do it um, in a way that, that is um, consistent with medical service payments in the last uh, about five years. So uh, next slide. Do I have control of the slides? Yeah. So so this is this is my very best summary slide. Um, so so when we started this work out ten years ago, um, we we the traditional way of thinking and the way I thought about it as well was that that, that seriously when you think about transitions of care, you know we're trying to get people to um, cross a gap between provider types, and their odds of doing that successfully. Uh, seem to be related to two things, and one is the size, the magnitude of the gap to be crossed, uh, meaning somebody who has a huge uh, burden of medical challenge and is trying to, you know, transition themselves out of the hospital. If they had this huge burden and have a very large gap to successfully cross, that that would put them at risk of not um, being successful in that and having to be readmitted to the hospital. And uh, the um, second um, feature was the capability of that person to do it. So um, this is an actual picture of a photographer that just leaped over this chasm um, in the Grand Canyon to get a picture, <laughs> and he survived. Uh, but but so, so when you think about it, you have this gap you have to cross, and then you have a person of varying capability to do that crossing. But, but when you think about the integrated model, um, you know, sort of a integration between medical services and general health and social support, you know, that's what really all comes together because the social environment in which the person lives um, affects both of those things dramatically. So certainly the person's context in which they live has a lot to do with the size of the gap they have to cross. So you could have a relatively small medical burden and a huge list of life challenges, and that makes the gap um, bigger. Um, in addition, your capacity is obviously directly related to whether you, whether or not you have, um, I don't know, had appropriate education, whether you're literate, whether you have resources at hand, whether you are accustomed to using resources at hand. Um, so this whole notion of a community environment in which a transition happens um, directly affects both of those things, which is why, um, you know, in the end, we're not really going to um, effectively deliver transitional care until we integrate the medical environment with um, the acknowledgement and direct employment of the of providers that uh, can directly address the community contextual environment in which the person lives. So that that summarizes my comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, as always, we appreciate your insights and the images that you bring to us that help us think about these things a little bit differently. Fantastic. And now, um, again, it's my pleasure to reintroduce Angela Lucente Prokop, the Regional Project Director at the Southwestern Pennsylvania Area Agency on Aging. She will also recap some of her key points from her presentation last month. Angela, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Risa. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Um, so when we shared a little bit about the Western Pennsylvania Community-Based Care Transitions Coalition, uh, I think a few of the key takeaways is that um, this is a partnership um, that was formed in the ninth scope of work that continued in the tenth uh, and, and now very much values from the ongoing partnership with QIO uh, within the context of care coordination. Uh, there are six acute care hospital partners and one community-based organization, which is an area agency on aging in southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, the community is serving 3,500 Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries annually, and their intervention 
was select that was selected based on root cause analysis is the uh, Coleman care transitions intervention. In addition to the four pillars um, that are inherent to that care transitions intervention, we are also identifying needs for community and social supports and making early linkages to those needs um, or to those supports to help address those needs. Um, and we also, again, you know, really look forward to the ongoing uh, partnership with QuinQIO and some of the things that are most valuable to that. Uh, partnership is the peer-to-peer -peer learning, uh, the ongoing reports and analysis, particularly as those have really evolved and they're very kind of distinct and I think kind of cutting edge and reflecting what's going on um, in the current environment already have, have evolved um, from what, what we were doing with care transitions. Uh, so we really value those reports and analysis and, and then also just support to uh, all of the partners in the community and ongoing care coordination efforts um, as this uh, care transitions program is a Medicare demonstration project and that does come to a close um, by January 1 of 2017. And for our community, it will come to a close this year in 2016. So uh, this ongoing partnership is a, a great uh, learning and support uh, to the community as they continue in uh, other efforts that still uh, include care coordination. And that's it for the summary, Lisa. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, so now, um, I'm very excited to have Dana Lambert with us from Primaris, part of the TMS Quality Innovation Network. Um, she's joining us today for a coaching and brainstorming session. Dana will share some of her greatest challenges in working with communities on effective communication and care coordination, and we will um, have kind of a joint Peer coaching and brainstorming session um, with the three of us, Angela, Jane, and myself. And again, I'd like to invite all of you in the audience to participate as well. Um, if you have questions, coaching questions you'd like to ask Dana to help her um, with the challenges that she presents us, or if you identify with this challenge and have some nuanced questions, I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but we will certainly try. Um, either by chat or in the Q&A portion of the call. Um, but yeah, we'd love to hear, again, your, your, your coaching questions, your general questions, um, as well as any of your own experiences. So Dana, welcome and thank you so much. Um, can you just briefly describe your challenge and what you'd most like to coach on today? Absolutely, thank you. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people will be able to uh, to relate, relate to this. Uh, but just for a little background, uh, I have a pretty good sized group that has hospital and health system representation from three different communities in the St. Louis, Missouri region. Um, and as the group evolved, the group wanted an identity going forward, so they came up with the, uh, the name SLAMS Collaborative, which stands for St. Louis Area Medication Safety Collaborative. And to further identify um, their work, the group decided that uh, the group was formed to create a forum to share best practices and to collaborate to solve uh, common medication safety issues in the St. Louis area hospitals and beyond, because um, we do have a few. As the, the group has grown and, I guess, word got around, we also took in a few um, Illinois hospitals, because they're right across the river. And, uh, and then also kind of broader and on the outside of St. Louis. So we, we keep expanding our, <laughs> our draw and, um, uh, interest in our meetings. So, uh, which is a good problem to have. Um, but they meet quarterly in the evening. And so like many of the other communities that everyone on, on this call, uh, works with, their work is, is done on their own time and, and in addition to all their other duties. And they do this because um, they have a passion for the work. Um, and this work is very broad, so uh, to, to rein in focus is, is sometimes a challenge. So my, my question um, is kind of once a group or community is together and really building momentum and having, you know, they're, they're definitely to a point that people are more open and communicating and sharing a lot of their challenges and uh, building momentum. So how do you keep a group focused on a common goal? Because obviously everybody brings their own um, challenges and, and things like that to the table. So 
because uh, so sometimes that gets to be a challenge. So uh, I would love to have some feedback on that. Wonderful. Thank you, Dana. Um, so who would like to start, Angela or Jane? Hi, sorry, Risa, I had myself on mute. Um, but uh, it sounds like a, a great start to the organization of your of your group, and um, and certainly I think um, having having just outlined a scope of responsibility and goals that your group is trying to achieve, um, and just kind of anchoring to those at the beginning of your meetings to help guide the work that you're. Um, setting out on um, at every meeting, it, it sounds like would would be helpful. I'm sure that these are the things that you're already doing um, as well, but I think sometimes everyone brings all of their kind of unique interests and, you know, they get excited about all the opportunities and um, scopes can uh, can grow on you within the context of those meetings. So that, that might be a little bit helpful. Yeah, and actually that's an um, interesting uh, approach because right now when we start our meetings and we go around and do introductions, uh, we kind of started with everyone introducing themselves and then saying anything uh, that they have worked on or progress that they have made since the last meeting. Um, and I think sometimes that opens us up to getting, <laughs> you know, a little bit too all over the board because everybody's talking about a different thing that they've made progress on or that they're putting focus on. So maybe if we start by, um, or even after that, bringing it back to the focus of the group, that might kind of help bring it back into what we're there to, to meet about is in terms of the group. So, uh, so yeah, that would be a, a, a probably a helpful um, thing to do. So thank you. Well, and this is Jane. So, Dana, um, I, I believe you probably all did a root cause analysis and or do a series of root cause analyses as the work progresses. Um, and, and I understand that often participants will, will say, find that the real purpose of root cause analysis is to describe what are the problems experienced by, you know, people, receivers of services um, in order to break it down into which part, you know, which cog in the wheel am I? Like, which part do I and or my institution have, uh, you know, direct influence over? And it's easy to, I think, um, uh, sort of just to it's the wrong word, but it's easy for people to start focusing on their piece, which is actually fine. So people who own similar components of the big picture, uh, I think probably often benefit from sharing um, that, you know, strategies for management of that component and, and or, you know, sort of collaborating on, on best practices. Um, but so I'm just, I'm wondering if you're using data or other techniques related to root cause analyses or other techniques to uh, uh, kind of wrap things up into the real, the bigger picture of what we are trying to accomplish here. Yes, that actually was one strategy that I just used um, at our last two meetings because the conversations were getting <laughs> kind of, you know, kind of scattered and um, to try to bring it back in to a common goal. I had uh, presented, we had pulled the zip codes from all three of the communities that we cover and um, I pulled that data that, that looked at the uh, adverse start events and readmissions for uh, those zip codes. And at the uh, first meeting, they uh, they looked at the, the data, and it was just like one year's worth of data, so four quarters. And they noticed, you know, some some declines in the anticoagulants. So they were kind of interested in seeing if any of, you know, if there was more of a trend there and if that maybe had anything to do with a lot of the new anticoagulants on the market. And um, so they asked me to go back uh, further and have additional years of data for the group to look at. So, um, so we were able to get three years of data to look at. Um, and uh, so that kind of helped them 
uh, I guess, kind of rein in their discussions and focus on uh, that data as a community, which I think was a reminder that we are there as a community to talk about community issues. Um, and uh, so I think that was helpful. So I think that suggestion going forward is, is very helpful, just to keep going back to something that brings them uh, together uh, on a component that they can all focus on. So. Yeah, and I'm curious whether they, whether people see the root causes of adverse drug events to be different by drug class. So, you know, there's been much attention to the opioid overuse problem, and it, and it strikes me that not only is regionalization of these events likely to be different, but um, I mean, the fundamental root causes may be different. I, it might be. I don't know. I'm just curious how you're coalition thinks about that. I'm wondering if it could help unify the work across participants um, while still sort of targeting the strategies um, a bit more narrowly. I mean, so the challenges for folks on anticoagulants are, I think, probably different than the challenges for people on opioids, but I could be wrong, and it could be not true in your community. Right, and... Um and actually, I think to look at it that way would be helpful. And the other challenge, uh, you know, we have, which I think is kind of moving, beginning to move in the right direction, is that Missouri is still the only state that does not have a prescription drug monitoring program. Um, and uh, there has just been some recent activity that the city and counties of St. Louis um, have decided to move forward on finding their own vendor and doing their own uh, program because they, they don't want to continue to wait on the, the state, mainly because of the, the opioid and heroin uh, epidemic. But so I think that's going to kind of help move some different initiatives uh, in a uh, positive way, too. But, yeah, I think, I, I think that's, that's a good suggestion as well. And, Gina, you know, this is Risa. Um, in, in thinking about also what you've described in, in coming together and how sometimes you start your meetings kind of going around, um, I know in a lot of the research that's been done on effectiveness of coalitions, um, there's sort of stages that groups can go through, if you will. And I think um, oftentimes they start, um, well, Oftentimes they start with just a group of people who show up and talk about the problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you know, as facilitators, leaders, you know, passionate people, no matter where we are as part of that coalition, you know, sometimes this can drive us crazy or it can, you know, help really spur us to action to help move that group forward. Um, but, but then, um, as the group starts to move toward some cohesiveness, they sort of form a, what I would call a community of practice style of group where you're talking about problems and it, it, it's focused on the community, but again, people end up going back and implementing, you know, ideas that were talked about in the group just in their own facility and then, like you said, come back and report on it. And there's actually nothing wrong with that, but, um, you know, part of the strength or the benefit of having a coalition, a community, you know, group that comes together to make some sort of change for the community is um, having a greater capacity to make um, change beyond just your organization. Um, so using the data that you talked about and that Jay was talking about, have you focused on or agreed upon with your coalition um, a particular goal that you all want to work for, or even, you know, backing up from that, even talking about and sort of acknowledging uh, the benefits of coming together as a group for uh, to problem solve or create change that, you, that people couldn't do by themselves, so sort of beyond their organization. And I found that helpful also is just to sort of acknowledge that in the room and even, you know, walking people through um, some of those stages. And I have some materials I could, I'd be happy to share with you, but um, I'd be curious to know if you had a conversation like that with your group. 
Um, we have not. Um, and yeah, I would I would love to see any any materials that uh, uh, that you have on that because um, I think we uh, the and and the difficult part with the the starting with the sharing is that everybody uh, because of the, the kind of the best practices or they find somebody else that's working on something that they've been struggling with so they kind of find a peer to connect with. Um, so I, I think they have gotten value out of that. It's just, uh, you know, how to, how to kind of follow that up by reining everybody back in. Because I, I, I get the, um, the value and the, the sharing and the, the, the discussions and, uh, but yeah, just reining it back in and bringing it back to focus, I think, is, is sometimes where they, um, uh, they have an issue, and like I said, the data definitely helped because it viewed something on a community level and made them all think of something broader for the community. So maybe, um, I, I, I would be curious if any of you thought, think that, like, a, um, because we've talked a few times about doing, um, a community assessment kind of as the next, uh, next move after looking at that data. Do you, have any of you had great experiences with doing that and really kind of come up with some real meat to work with from doing community assessments? Good question. So I wonder if we could open this up to other participants. So I, I, I think, um, I think the folks in Washington may have um, good ideas to add to. I was just in Seattle for a really great meeting. <laughs> a lot of discussion of similar um, issues. So, Jane, do we want to open up the phone line, or are we asking for their participation in chat? Uh, well, whatever you think. <laughs> um, that's some good news. So, um, a little bit of a, I think Carol might be on the line from Washington. Um, uh, just to give you a little heads up, if you'd like to call in, I would say I'll, I'll read a few things that are in chat right now just to give you a chance. And then, yeah, operator, we can go ahead and um, open up. And, and this is directed specifically at Washington if you want to join the queue. But also for anyone else who... Um, has would like to weigh in on the question that Dana just asked. And uh, just to give you a chance, I'll let the operator um, give instructions for how to get into the queue. And then I'll read some of the chat questions. And if you'd like to ask a question over the phone, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. And one thing that has come in from Washington, um, Early on, they suggested uh, or wanted to know if you had ever used um, a SWAT tool with your coalition yet, and that stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. We have not, um, and that's actually uh, a good suggestion that um, I might talk to uh, the, uh, the other facilitator for the group and suggest that maybe we take one of these approaches, whether it be a SWOT analysis or a community assessment or whatever, and maybe do something like that to kind of bring things back into, um, I think everybody's just been so excited with the progress and the different things that we've talked about. I think it's, you know, I, I think it's just kind of gotten us off track. So I think something like that would help uh, bring us back in. That's great. And do we have anybody in the queue yet? We do have a question over the phone from Carol Higgins. Your line is now open. Hi, this is Carol, and I apologize for what's left of my voice. I'll do the best I can here. Um, I'm the one that put in the information about the SWAT exercise. Um, we have found it to be very useful. I've done it with multiple communities now in our state. Um, it is a has been a real asset in being able to go beyond that first bloom of excitement and then some work is done and then things kind of wane a little bit. 
Um, we have started it out with we're sort of been a combination of sending their data and giving them that information, and then having them, and we literally um, have people who have sticky notes, um, fortune colors of sticky notes, and we ask them in a group to take a few minutes to jot down on a sticky note, each one separately, what they would consider to be a strength of the group, the community coalition or whatever group it is we're working with, to jot down an individual sticky note, what they think the strengths are, um, and in some detail, um, and sometimes it's just the fact that the group is together, the fact that they've been together for X number of months or years. Um, it may be that we have a strong leadership um, from multiple levels of the organization. You know, it can be a variety of things. So we have a strong cross-section. So it can be some of the strengths. The weaknesses are often things like um, we're not sure we have the right people here at the table. Um, we have folks from marketing and nursing homes, but not from clinical staff. Um, it can be everything to one of the weaknesses that often comes up is we don't have enough people from the non-Medicare post acute services, things like that. Um, then opportunities are sort of the, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this? Or maybe it would be nice if we could do that. And encourage them to not only put down what they think would be cool if the group did, but what they think would be cool if, if what I call dyads, or two or three settings working on it together. Because so often as the community coalition work moves forward, a lot of the low-hanging fruit on community work will sort of get harvested, and then we have to sort of look a little bit more deeply to find, well, if this, these three nursing homes try this, or this dyad of a hospital and nursing home tries that. And I've pushed a lot here in Washington State to get folks to incorporate the emergency medical services or community paramedic groups because they're seeing our patients more than anybody. So those are some of the kinds of opportunities I will sometimes bring up. And then under the threats, I tend to not use the word threats as much as I use um, things that are getting in the way. So um, sometimes that can be everything from changes in leadership of the organization or buyouts from one hospital system to another or um, changing economics or the biggest uh, mill in town closed and the economy is tanking. It can be any kind of thing like that from global, full community to individuals. And then we take those and put them up on, on pieces of paper up on the walls, you know, chart paper up on the walls and then talk them over. And then the next logical step is then, okay, looking at the opportunities, what sorts of things cluster together? And then we'll do a sheet on potential projects to work on together either in larger groups or smaller groups. And in two of our communities, we've ended up forming three work groups that then have reported back to the whole thing, where there's been three major areas, but not something that everybody wanted to agree on, but we've had work groups then come back and, and report out. So it's gone different avenues or different directions depending on the community and their depth, but I've found it to be very useful, as I say, in multiple communities here. We tended to do it around the first of the year because that was a good time to kind of reevaluate what was happening. No, oh, that's great. Thank you for that suggestion because I, I think and the, I think the start of the year is probably an appropriate time too because that would give us time to finish fleshing out any discussion about the data and then um, any kind of stragglers from our, our past couple of meetings and then kind of start kind of a new start to the year. So we usually have a meeting in um, February. So I think that would probably be a really great time, and I can maybe just bring it up that we're going to do that uh, at the, the meeting before that. So that's a great suggestion. Thank you so much. And one of, you're welcome. One of the nice things about having people write their phone up on sticky notes and have it on a piece of paper, then you can go forth afterwards and write the notes up much more easily um, and be able to send it out to everybody, particularly for those that weren't at the meeting, so that if you do form work groups, then they can volunteer to participate in some of them. Ah, good idea. Yeah. Thank you so much, Carla, for our, Carla, uh, I was reading chat, um, Carol, for calling in. And I think we'll just go ahead and segue into our Q&A facilitated discussion, um, especially since the lines are already open. And I know there's a lot of good stuff in chat. So um, I'll actually turn it over to Steve in just a second, but I'll ask the operator, can you please uh, tell us the instructions to 
um, into the queue to ask a question. And again, ladies and gentlemen, that is star one on your telephone keypad to ask a question. Wonderful. Steve, um, can you uh, highlight some of the things that us in chat? Absolutely, and I actually, uh, if it's all right with you, Rita, I'm going to see if I can pull some of the folks uh, that have, have asked some, uh, some coaching questions here in chat to the line to ask their question. Um, so the, the first question that I, I saw is from Nancy Lawson. Nancy, are you able to, to dial into the, the speaker line? I think it was star one. I think it's a great question to ask. Do we have anybody on the line? A question or comment? There are no questions on the phone line at this time. All right. Well, then I will channel Nancy when I ask this question, Dana. Um, so she was curious if you were using a formal charter or a charter-type document uh, to support the community. We do not. The, um, initially, when we talked about doing that, the, uh, the pharmacist that I was actually working with thought that that would make some people uncomfortable. Um, Mainly because I think this, we were doing these meetings in the evening and it was kind of, uh, you know, on their own time and just because of the benefits of it. But we since then have actually, we sent a letter to the leadership at each hospital to let them know that we have this group and they're really doing great things and um, kind of what we're about and who makes up the group and things like that just to get the leadership buy-in and support for their um, their folks participating uh, and sharing at these meetings. And all of the leaders were very supportive and um, I think the response that the, the, the folks got back were, um, were a lot more than they expected. So I think we might revisit that. Um, so that's a, that's a good reminder to, to go back since we did kind of do that outreach with the, to the leadership that it might be a good time to revisit doing um, an official charter. All right. That's interesting how it, how it changed. Cool. And Nancy, sorry you can't off mute. I see that you posted another comment. So and now Reese is trying to help you. Sorry. All right. Cool. Great. Thanks, Dana. Um, let me scroll through that here and find the next question. I think it's from Carol. Carol, this is Steve. Is there any way you can dial in? I see a question in your uh, in your first statement about the, the difference between the goals of the group and the, the organization. Let's see if you're able to get in. Star one. You're welcome, Nancy. And there are no questions at this time. All right. So it sounds like I'm just going to get to read some of these questions to you, Dana. Sorry. All right. So Cheryl's uh, question here in the in the chat comment is: Do you think that the uh, the organizations are learning from each other and taking back what they learned? The organization are they bringing their passions together to tackle the bigger issues upstream? Uh, I do think they're taking them back to their uh, organizations and working with their departments and with their their teams at the hospital just because some of them, when they've come back and reported, um, when I said that we do kind of that report out at the beginning of each meeting, uh, many of them have come back with updates and um, and follow up on, you know, on, on uh, what they've accomplished since the last meeting and um, – uh, we've also incorporated the College of Pharmacy, so they have also kind of um, added another element to the group because, you know, when some of the hospitals um, are struggling with uh, certain certain things or certain projects, then sometimes the, the College of Pharmacy can help them out with whether that's providing students to 
to help out or suggestions with things that, that, that they've experienced or some of their faculty have experienced. Um, so I do think that they, they are going back and, and having discussions and because and we, we hear a lot of those updates. Um, uh, and they've also started doing chart discussions. So when one of the hospitals has a really interesting uh, case or um, experiences uh, an adverse drug event that is uh, kind of unusual or that they think would be of interest to others in the group, uh, they actually, you know, because they're not, they can, don't really want to air their dirty laundry, so they actually send the case to me and I present it blindly and then the group opens it up for discussion and how they've handled it and if anybody else has experienced the same thing, just everybody that kind of can learn from that uh, that error. So that's kind of been another era, way that they've kind of shared and uh, kind of evolved over the past year. Okay, that's interesting. Cool. Let's see. Any more chat questions? Sorry, it takes me a second to prefer from listening to reading. Well, Steve, while you're reading, I'll just remind everyone, um, uh, please feel free to call in or chat in a question. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, for Dana specifically, but any question that you have for yourself or a comment or um, anything that you'd actually like to follow up on, either from today or um, perhaps if you were on last month's call and had a question that you didn't get a chance to ask. We have all of our speakers on the line. So you can go ahead and um, type those in as well. Sure. So this is Jane, uh, and I, I, I'm sorry. I, I was wondering about the, <laughs> I was wondering about the, about the, um, uh, whether folks are able to incorporate, um, you know, beneficiaries and or, you know, patients or, uh, people who have received medical services recently um, into their um, meetings. Because I, I, every time I see this, I think it's so powerful to hear, to basically hear about the day, in, you know, a day in the life of a person who's actually negotiating these challenges to kind of, you know, help to keep people focused on the real goal. Um, but I think mean, this powerful technique also. Now, there's nobody busier than somebody who has just um, had a you know significant medical event. So, so I know it was in my direct experience in the um, community projects in Colorado. It's often it's difficult to get um, people and or their caregivers you know directly involved. But I wonder I wonder if others could reflect on their experience with that. And this is Dana Lammer, and I'll just mention that we have not got to that point. I would love to, because I, I, I agree that I think that's so valuable and powerful to have that family or beneficiary there, you know, to um, to share an experience like that. So I would love to evolve to a point that we get there, but at this point we have not. And do you have you approached this with uh, the sort of provider representatives who are currently attending the meeting? Is there is this uh, when you say you haven't evolved? Um, do you mean that you don't believe that attendees would be comfortable with it yet, or, or is there some other kind of evolution that needs to happen? Yeah, I think just more that um, that we've had so much to get our our arms around to this point, just trying to get the the group together and you know adding members and. Um, you know, just kind of getting everybody to a comfort level of sharing and uh, things like that. I think we've just had so much trying to get it up and going. And maybe on a quarterly basis, you know, it, it, it just it's, it's almost not enough to accomplish everything we want to accomplish. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's just we just haven't gotten there yet that, because of all the other stuff we've been trying to tackle. Jane, it sounds like Cheryl, uh, they're at a, a similar place where they're beginning to invite people 
uh, but they haven't been able to get anyone to actually attend yet. Yeah, they're the busiest people on the planet. Um, yeah, I, I would say that we did not solve that uh, problem effectively. But, but you know, and I wonder if I wonder if sometimes we take the wrong approach in terms of I don't know, trying to find the dramatic cases because. And then, okay, I'm going to deteriorate for just a second and talk like a medical service provider. So there's nothing more off-putting than somebody that's had a horrible experience. <laughs> it just makes everybody in the room so uncomfortable. <laughs> and I just wonder if we couldn't become more sophisticated about about involving directly involving ordinary experience, not shocking situations. I'm so anyway, I, I acknowledge that that um, you know I did not solve this problem. When I was um, directly involved in local community coalitions, but I'd love to hear from people who are comfortably and routine, routinely involving the perspective of you know, everyday experience. I mean, gosh, you know, if we look at our Part D data, for instance, I mean, just to follow with the theme of, of looking at some medication management, you know, I mean, it's, it's the majority of Medicare beneficiaries leave hospitals on 10 or more meds, like, I don't know. Just my own personal experience trying to take an antibiotic two or three times a day for ten days. Yeah, I can't imagine. I can't imagine how complicated that gets. I posed that question, Jane, to the group, so we'll see if we, we get anyone with quick thoughts on that. Um, in the meantime, we we got a note from Jennifer Wright saying that they've. Uh, Sounds like a, a newly formed or uh, freshly off the ground beneficiary and family advisory council, um, and that group has expressed interest in being a part of their meeting. So we're going to begin working with them. Sounds promising. And this is Risa. I was even wondering if we have any beneficiaries um, or family members or caregivers um, even on the line who might be willing to speak up on this, if you, if you already participate in or um, would even love the opportunity to participate in a community coalition. And uh, I'll put that in chat, too. And then we had uh, someone last month speak up. And we do have a question over the phone line from Carol Higgins. Your line is now open. Hi, it's Carol again in Washington. And a thought just occurred to me as you folks were talking about this, and I don't know if it would work or not, but um, I'll post it to the group. Um, year ago, I had a total knee replacement, and when I was, the day before I was, or the morning before I was taking out of the hospital, two volunteers came and talked to me, um, making sure I had the resources that I needed, et cetera. If I had any questions, when they identified themselves as volunteers, and they asked if I would be willing to um, be videotaped, um, talking about my experience, and you know, with consent forms and, and things like that. And while the reasons I think that they had for that were twofold, one was that they were trying to have um, a cadre of videos for people who were going to be having total knee replacements. Uh, hear about how people can experience the care there at that particular institution. Um, I think they probably also used some for marketing, because um, I think I saw some of them on TV commercials, not mine, thank goodness. But I'm wondering if there's a way that we could somehow harvest that concept, because it is hard to get people to come to a meeting, but if we can get folks, um, get our providers to see if they could get short vignettes, short video vignettes of patient experience, um, that could then be shared at a meeting. Perhaps that's something that we could work with. Just thought. I'd love to hear people's feedback. So 
This is Steve. Uh, if you guys want to provide that feedback to Carol, uh, feel free to use chat or dial in right now. Carol, it's Angela from Western Pennsylvania, and I would share that within the care transitions communities, um, in the context of the learning collaboratives, communities have shared uh, videos and very powerful success stories um, that include the patient voice, and they really have been very motivating and inspirational, and they've been a really good launching point for some work sessions within the context of those, you know, one to two day learning conferences. So that really could be a good uh, a good jumping off point too for Dana's group. Fantastic. We have about um, one minute left for discussion. Um, so please, um, still, you know, we can probably take uh, one, maybe two questions. Um, I keep shouting in, and I'm just going to uh, switch ahead here to remind everyone of our call to action from last month. And uh, we'd love to hear from you, either by chat or um, either in the assessment on um, any actions that you took from last month to this um, to this call. Um, again, you know, partially for yourself, but also for us to know. I know that, you know, so many of us, if not all of us on this call, are working to, um, you know, improve processes and make care better in some way. And we can all, uh, we all enjoy hearing from one another and getting that inspiration. So if you have a story to tell about how you've gotten connected, um, either started, started to get connected or get better connected, um, or even starting to look at some of your own processes, maybe something that um, you've discovered for yourself. We'd love to have you share, um, and you can share that with Nikki Rosellis as well. And Steve also um, just typed in the uh, QAO program website as well. So thank you for that. So as we begin to wrap up, um, we invite you all to join us for the next National Learning in Action Network call in August. And Steve will type in the registration link here. Um, so go ahead and for those of you who are ready to register already. Um, and the, the topic for that call will, uh, we will talk about making care safer by reducing harm caused in the delivery of care. That will be a very interesting call and um, certainly certainly aligned with the quality strategy and pertinent to um, all of us in some way, shape, or form. And lastly, call for future topics. We absolutely always want to hear from you. Um, what ideas you have, what questions you might have that might um, help us think about what topics and speakers we need to bring to this audience to help you in your work or somebody that you've been inspired by that you think would be a good speaker or topic for future calls, future national calls. Um, we definitely want to hear from you. And you can submit your ideas um, at this email on the screen. And again, Steve is sharing that in chat um, or in the, in the post-event assessments that will come up um, right after the call. And those are my announcements. So I just want to go back and see if there's any last-minute questions. And there are no questions over the phone line. All right. And Steve, is there anything in chat that you wanted to highlight before we before we adjourn? Um, let's see. There were a couple of comments um, about again getting uh, patients and beneficiaries engaged. Uh, and then Cindy Fifty uh, made a comment that they used a uh, video from the AMA. Uh, around medication management, kind of going along with uh, Carol's thought or question for the group. I think those are the last two things to come through chat. Wonderful. So, again, the, um, all the materials and the recordings in this call will be posted so you can see um, 
some of those comments in chat if you've missed it, or you can look through right now quickly and grab some of those references if they've been helpful to you. And with that, I will say thank you all very, very much. Um, and again, thank you so much to Angela, Jane, and Dana for being on this call. Um, it was a great call. Thanks, everyone, for your participation and your great questions. And hopefully we'll hear from all of you in August. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.